All right, so welcome everyone in, on per, in person and online to our service today. So grateful for you, so grateful for the Holy Spirit's presence in our service today. Really, really powerful. Um, I know everyone wants to know, how is Brian doing? How is I, how, you know, they're not talking about me being sick, but how am I doing? Because Georgia got beat last night and all that. And, you know, it's just good morning to everyone except those who are Bama fans. So just kidding. No, I'm doing great. You know, it's just a, it's just a game and really has nothing to do with eternity or anything of eternal value. It's only a game. And the, the one positive I walk away from from this game is if you remember, Terry Bennett had a word. And his, the word that the Lord gave him back in 2010 was, when Georgia wins the national championship, it will be a sign that Jesus is coming back soon. And so they win two in a row in, uh, you know, last year and the year before. And so my good friend Ben DeSmukes, who's spoken here before, he, was all, he hates Georgia. He hates Georgia more than he likes tech, but he hates Georgia with a passion and he kept ragging me. He's like, yeah, Georgia's a sign of the Antichrist. You know, they're going to have three and a half years of dominance, and it's going to be a sign of the Antichrist. And I'm just thankful that they only had 2.9 years of dominance and not three and a half years, because then they would have been a sign of the Antichrist. So that's the, uh, that's the way I'm looking at this, spinning it in a positive way. So anyway, I'm doing perfectly fine. It's, it's, it's just a game. It has no eternal value whatsoever. Okay. At least that's what I'm telling myself. But, okay, so we're going to go ahead and we're picking up. I think we took about a, I don't know, a month or six-week break from Indwelling Life. But this is like session 117 of Indwelling Life. And this is actually, no, session 16, part 8. I mean, it's just like the never-ending Indwelling Life. It's just going on and on and on. But anyway, this session we're, we're focused on is we're still focused on renewing the mind and the importance of renewing the mind that when that that mindsets can block the flow of the holy spirit that we our minds must be renewed so that our mindsets don't block the flowing of the holy spirit because what what the way we think determines the way we live and if our mind is not in alignment with the indwelling holy spirit then it will suppress the spirit of god inside of you even though the holy spirit dwells in you if you're born again even though your spirit, and the, and your, your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one, they literally touch each other. They are connected together in a vital union. God's spirit has been grafted to your human spirit. Yet even though that's true, even though that's a reality, um, your mind, your, sorry, my aunt was just mocking me. I have my hand motions, my daughter. <clears throat> that's why I was grinning. Your mind can block the flow of the Holy Spirit. And so we've been talking about mental strongholds, how mental strongholds that block the mind. We've been really focused on rejection and how rejection uh, blocks the hindrance of the, or blocks the flowing of the Holy Spirit. And I want to open today, turn into a, a scripture. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And we've, we talk about this a lot here, but it, it's so important to understand, even as we are do, going into uh, talking about rejection and how the soul responds to rejection and the way the soul copes with rejection when we've been rejected. Uh, I just want to just give us a, a high-level view of where we're going in this. It's Hebrews 4, verse 12. Um, the writer of Hebrews is talking, and he says, For the word of God is living. Now, that's, that's what we want to just focus on, is the word of God is living. It's not a dead book. It's not just like some antiquated book that has no relevance to your life. No, the word of God is living. The Word of God is active. The living, active Word of God is, a, is sharper than any two-edged sword. How we need the Word of God, how we need the truth of God's Word to come, and like Hebrews talks about, it's sharper than to any two-edged sword, and it pierces to the division of soul and spirit. See, what this author of Hebrews is telling us right here is that there is a, that without the division of the word of God, of the sharp two-edged sword of the word of God, without that sharp two-edged sword of the word of God, 
there is this blending together of the soul and the spirit that you can't separate that which is of the spirit, and I'm talking primarily the spirit of God, and that which is of the soul. Because they're so blended together, it takes this surgery, this surgical penetration of the word of God to divide, to show us this is what is coming from your soul and this is coming from your spirit. And the reason for that The reason we need that is when once we begin to see, oh, the way I'm thinking right now is is soulish thinking. The way I'm, my mindset right now is soulish. It's from the soul. It's of the soul. It's not from the spirit. We can divide it. We can separate it so that we can live from the spirit by the spirit without blockage or hindrance. We need this. Lord, I'm even asking, Lord, today in this message, let the the two-edged sword of your word, Lord, divide, to divide between soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So that's kind of where I'm coming from today is I want us to be able to see, okay, we need, God willing, the anointing on this message so that we can understand the way we respond when we are rejected. And we also want to see This response forms strongholds in the mind that Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, strongholds in the mind that that are like ancient city walls that keep God out and keep self in, and it it actually hinders the release of the Spirit of of the Spirit of the Lord from within you flowing out. Because when even though we are even though we are one with the Holy Spirit. Even though we are one with the Holy Spirit, the mind that has been rejected, the mind that has been wounded can form mental uh, strongholds, thoughts and reasonings and coping mechanisms and defense mechanisms and all these different things that end up making uh, the life of God in you. Even though you have the life of God in you, his life is suppressed because the mind is in control. The soul is in in control. These are strongholds. And Paul says... The weapons of our warfare are mighty in God for the destruction of fortresses, for the destruction of, and if you read the context, the destruction of mental barriers, mental roadblocks that are exalted against the knowledge of God, and we're tearing those down, okay? This is what this is about. It's it's exposing mental strongholds. It's tearing them down by weapons that are not physical. It's the Word of God by the Spirit of God anointed, And it's tearing those mental strongholds down so that, Paul says, your obedience can be complete. What Paul's telling us is, is when the mind has strongholds, whether they're demonic, whether they're of the soul, whether it's a mixture of both, Paul's telling us when when strongholds are in operation, what happens then is that our obedience is partial. Our obedience is incomplete. But when those strongholds come down, the obedience to Jesus Christ is complete. That would be the same thing as saying bridal readiness. Being made ready as a bride for Jesus Christ comes through full obedience, and full obedience comes when our mind has been renewed. Does that make sense? So we're, we're deconstructing here mental roadblocks that are hindering the life of God. Because remember this. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32, you will know the truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know, as we've been going through this series on rejection, I, I, I remember the last time I did it about six, a month ago or six weeks ago, whenever that was, I remember just seeing everyone's faces looking at me like, you were absolutely reading my mail. I mean, you're describing exactly the way I am. And I've had people come up to me afterwards and said, okay, okay, I've got every one of those things. You know, all of us probably have every one of those things. It's, it's, you know, so definitely don't feel like, oh, I'm the only one that feels this way. No, I promise you, I hear the stories. I promise you that you're not the only one that's, that is going this way. This is the way a lot, a lot of us, most of us are. We've experienced rejection. The soul responds in a certain way to rejection. And a lot of times we don't even realize, oh, the way I am, the way I've been, you know, my character that's been formed, the habits that's been formed, the responses, this, these soulish 
or psychological responses, the emotional, mental responses that I've had from this have shaped my character and it's made me who I am. I don't even know anything different. And Jesus would say to this, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so we're doing this not to like point it out or make you feel bad or any of that. It's more you're going to know the truth and the truth will make you free. See, how rejection affects us, God created us to be lovers. God created us to love God, or I would say it this way, God created us to receive God's love. And out of the overflow of receiving God's love, we then love him back, first commandment, and then we love others, second commandment. That is the, the life you've been called to, is love. Experience God's love, love him back, love others. And yet when rejection, which is the opposite of love, hits you, all that God created you for is affected by that. And so we're asking the question, how does rejection affect you? How does rejection affect us? Um, and everyone's different in this, so it's not like everyone responds in the exact same way. But everyone's different. But these are just the common fruits of rejection that we've been looking at. Um, and in, in the last session, we looked at uh, some of the fruits of rejection being rebellion, independence, anger, bitterness, insecurity, inferiority, and escapism. And everyone's like, yeah, 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 got all of those. Um, and the cure for this, the ultimate cure or how you get victory is, is by experiencing the love of God. God's love is the solution. And so I, before we, before we um, start talking about some of the fruit of rejection here, I want to read, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, where Paul is writing, Paul is praying. I want to encourage you, make this part of your prayer. What, what Paul is saying is how you get victory over rejection. Paul said in, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, that you, being rooted and grounded in love. What does that sound like? It sounds like Paul's talking about you're like a tree. And your root system must go down deep into the ground, into the soil of God's love. Because the fruit you're meant to produce, the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, all the fruit of the Spirit flows out of love. You can, you can do a cross-reference between 1 Corinthians 13 and Galatians 5, where Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. And you can look at it in 1 Corinthians 13 when Paul says love is kind and patient and you can see the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of love. And if your root system is not grounded in the love of God, then the fruit you're going to, when it's not ground, when it's not, when your root system is not rooted and grounded in the love of God, it's actually rooted and grounded in the soil of rejection. And whatever your root system is rooted in is going to be the type of fruit you produce. So if, you're, if your root system is rooted and grounded in the love of God, you're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit. If your root system is rooted and grounded in rejection, you're going to produce the fruit of rejection, rebellion, insecurity, inferiority, hardness, defense, defensiveness, distrust, cynicism, independence, all this different fruit. So are we producing the fruit of rejection or are we producing the fruit of love? See, what, what type of fruit are we producing is determined by the, the root system that we are grounded in. And a lot of us, if we're going to be honest, have some level of mixture. We have some rejection and some love. So the fruit we're producing is usually a mixed bag of fruit. We've got some of the fruit of the Spirit and some of the fruit of rejection, but God wants to do a work to get us completely uprooted from this soil of rejection, uh, uprooted, transplanted, and then sinking our roots down into the love of God that Paul is talking about here in Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> that you, being rooted and grounded in love, 
may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. In other words, Paul's saying, what Paul's saying here by this description, this very incredible description of the love of God, he's saying this, the love of God is infinite. The depth of God's love, the height of God's love, the length of God's love, the breadth of God's love is infinite. It cannot be, I cannot get up here and talk about the love of God and give you five points about the love of God and you walk away going, okay, I've experienced the love of God. That's just knowledge. And Paul says, know that you are to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. <clears throat> what Paul is getting at is, it is imperative for your root system to go down deep into the soil of God's love that is experiential of God's love. Not just head knowledge, not just quoting some Bible verses, not just singing, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so, but actually experiencing by the Holy Spirit the love of God that is infinite, that goes beyond the human mind, that cannot be articulated. It's one of those things when, when God's love touches you, you begin to weep and you begin to cry. You know, people are like, why are you crying? You never, ever cry. God's love, his love is touching me. Jesus, and you, 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 they're like, what, what's going on? And you're like, eyes are filled with tears. And you're like, Jesus loves me. And you're like, okay, that's, that's like we learn about that in third grade in Sunday school. But you've experienced it. You've tasted it. His, his love has washed over you. His love has healed you. And then that's what Paul's praying for is that you would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. He's, he's, he's basically he's saying you need to experience the love of Christ that you may be filled up with the fullness of God. So that's the solution. Everything we're going to talk about next, the fruit of rejection, the, thing, the way we respond to rejection, you, you say, okay, what's the answer? How do, what's the solution? How do I get healing here? How do, you, how do I get that? It's the love of God. It is the, you know, and it's not something you get, you experience one time. It's the unfolding experience of the love of God until we're filled up with the fullness of his love. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so we're going to step through some of these here of some of the, continuing on the, the, the fruit and the symptoms of rejection is we're going to talk about now distrust and cynicism is some of the fruits of rejection. When you have experienced rejection, there's a million ways you, you've ex, you experience rejection. All of us have experienced rejection, some deeper, some not as so deep. But when you experience rejection, one of the ways that, we, that it's typical for us to respond is through distrust and cynicism. And a lot of times we don't even, we don't even realize it, but what happens is when our trust has been violated, when someone has hurt us, when someone has wounded us, when someone has rejected us, however it comes about, whether it's a parent or a spouse or a girlfriend, boyfriend or friend, whatever it is, and you've been rejected, if, especially if that rejection cuts very deep, the, one of the things that happens is, especially if you, if you trusted a person and they let you down, what happens is distrust begins to form and then cynicism. Cynicism begins to form where you become cynical and you're like, okay, Everyone, I, I can't trust anyone. I just can't trust anyone. I, I can't trust, I, I can't, I don't trust, this, I don't even, I don't trust leaders. I don't trust friends. They let me down. They're going to let me down again. And, and what happens is we, we, we for, develop this distrust and a cynicism where we become, you know, extremely cynical with the glass is always half full. And we become this, develop this cynical attitude of negativity, of pessimism, we're like, you know, we just assume the worst of everyone, and we, we've, all trust has been lost when we experience rejection. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. We all probably have experienced that. But especially when, see, what, when you get into rejection, what happens is a lot of times with rejection is you have these expectations. In any relationship, you have expectations that, that they love me if they do these things. They do one through 10. These are my expectations. And if they really love me, they're going to do one through 10. Well, when those, those expectations are not met and you have failed expectations of what you think love should be, then you experience rejection. And when that happens, it leads to greater cynicism or skepticism towards people. So we got to be very careful that 
that we don't, because of our own rejection, because hurting people always hurt people. And so if hurting people always hurt people and they hurt you, it's very easy when you've been hurt to now then say, okay, I don't trust anyone. I don't trust you know, let's say, let's say that a, let's say that a, ch- a church leader hurts you, whatever. Um, and hopefully you're not thinking about me. No, I'm kidding. But a, a church leader hurts you in a different church, okay, not this church. But a church leader hurts you and you experience woundedness from a, a, a spiritual leader. Is your, your tendency is to then say, well, I don't trust any leader. Your tendency is to project that wound of rejection onto every single leader out there and say, I can't trust anyone because of this wound of rejection. You see how you, you project that, that wound of rejection you experience from this leader onto every other leader out there, and therefore you say, all of them are corrupt. All of them are depraved. All of them have ulterior motives. All of, and, and the reality is, yeah, some of them do, but the reality is there's, there's many out there, spiritual leaders, that are walking before the Lord with clean hands and a pure heart who are truly shepherds after God's own heart. But the, what we have done is we have projected our woundedness onto another leader, and we've, we've taken our distrust that's developed through rejection, and we're saying, I don't trust, I will not trust another leader. I mean, you could apply it in relationships. You could apply it in you know, marriage, you can apply in however you want, you know, rela- uh, children, however you want to apply that. You can apply the same principle in so many different ways is when you have been rejected, it causes your heart because when you're, when you're rejected, you put trust in someone and you, you, you put your trust into someone and that trust was violated, then it, it wounds your heart so that you can't trust, you, you feel like you can't trust anyone else. That makes sense? You've got to be very careful of that. All of us have to be very careful. We have to watch, that's why Solomon said, to watch over your heart. One of the things in watching over your heart is, have you become that way? Have you become like, okay, I just can't trust anyone. I can't trust anyone that says, that speaks for God, or I can't trust anyone, they're not going to hurt me. I'm, I'm cynical, I'm pessimistic about everyone. Everyone's depraved, we, we all are depraved, but you know, you're like, oh, the total depravity of man. There's no one out there that's good. Well, when you get saved, you actually have the Holy Spirit. And people who walk by the Spirit do produce good fruit. So when, when you have experienced that rejection, whether it's through rejection, betrayal, it leads to this distrust and disillusionment. And so we got to be careful even of disillusionment because we have these expectations. We have this idealization of this ideal world and the way we're in this ideal, these ideal relationships or whatever, the, the way our expectations are here, and when those aren't met, the, the idealization or, the, or what we expect to happen doesn't happen. It can produce disillusionment in us to where we grow cynical and distrusting. And I'm not going to go into all the details here, but I, you know, just in a different, in a very different way, I'm walking through this, not really so much in rejection, but through uh, disappointment in another, I'm not going to go into the details, in in another area. I'm walking through this where like, God, I feel like my heart is really being tempted not to trust uh, leaders or trust people in certain situations. I feel my heart becoming cynical and pessimistic about the church. And is there anyone out there that really has, uh, that really has a heart for God? Is there anyone out there that really has a heart after God's heart? Is there really one out there that has pure motives that wants to see the church of Jesus Christ built and not their own ministry? Is there any, you know, I'm working through this right now where disillusionment has hit me. Like, okay, you know, you you trusted someone and your, your trust was let down. Disillusionment happens. Cynicism happens. I'm trying to guard my heart. Okay, Lord, let this not happen to my heart. Let me not grow cynical. Let me not grow distrust here. And so, you know, we got to be aware of that. We got to be aware of that. And we also have to be aware of when we have been hurt, when we have been wounded, what we, we do is we create these defense mechanisms, these protections that we do. And one of the ways, without even realizing it, we use as self protection against future rejection is cynicism. It actually gives us comfort when we become cynical. It gives us comfort to know that, okay, if we're cynical and we don't expect, 
good things to happen or we don't expect hopeful things to happen, we become cynical. It actually guards us from future disappointment. Does that make sense? The hope deferred makes the heart sick. Is to guard against that hope deferred, whether it's in situations, whether it's in relationships, to guard against that hope deferred, we create defense mechanisms, self-protection that helps us guard against future rejection, but what it actually does is it creates barriers to keep others out. And you actually become miserable when you're living in, this place, in a state of cynicism. You're negative, you're pessimistic, you're hopeless about the future. We've got to be careful that our hearts don't grow cynical. I mean, even, even just even in our own nation, all that we've seen over the last 10 years in our nation, just the, you know, we, we thought that we lived in this country that was so we're a Christian nation. You know, for many years we thought, okay, we're, we're a Christian nation. Even though we got a lot of issues, we're a Christian nation. Once, once the veil comes off and you really see the corruption of this nation and all that it is, I'm not going to go into the details, once you see all that, it creates this disillusionment in you. You're like, uh, we are far from a Christian nation. You know, I had this idealized view of America and the, the veil's coming off and I'm seeing us for what we really are. I'm like, dear Lord, you know, cynicism and pessimism comes in. You know, just those, those images shattered. Um, even, even in rejection, you got to be very careful when you have been rejected that you don't project onto other people what you think they're going to, you know, like, like, for example, if you have been rejected and they rejected you in a certain way, it's very easy to project onto another person what uh, the other person did to you. Does that make sense? So, so if someone rejects you, someone, someone comes and they reject me, and they call me Opie, you know, like I talked about in the last session. I don't know, I'm just coming up with something on the top of my head. They call me Opie instead of Dolph Lundgren. And, uh, you know, they call me Opie. And so then I can project that onto someone else that when they really get to know me, they're going to call me Opie as well. I mean, that's just a dumb example. But it's easy to take your woundedness and how you experience rejection and project that onto someone else, and you don't even realize it, and you think, okay, I'm you don't even realize it, but you're projecting your woundedness onto someone else, thinking that they're going to do the same thing to you that, that this other person did. And what happens is it creates a barrier in that relationship, so love is hindered in that relationship. When, also, when you have been rejected, it's very easy for you to misinterpret everything as rejection. You know, like, um, okay, just I'm just throwing up examples that come off the top of my head. When we first got married, can I talk about the shirt? Okay. Okay. When we first got married, Angie bought this purple shirt. <laughs> we, we joke about it now, so it's funny. She bought this purple shirt, and I was like, oh, I hate this shirt. It's so terrible. But I didn't want to, like, tell her that because I was thinking, okay, if I tell her that, she's going to think I don't like her or think she's pretty or whatever. But I just didn't like the shirt. And so finally, you know, it came, I don't even know how it came. I, I, oh, okay, Angie actually said, Did, uh, do you like this shirt? And I'm like, yeah, it's beautiful. You know, in a Scooby-Doo <laughs> voice, I love it. Why wouldn't I love it? <clears throat> And so she's like, okay, you got the Scooby-Doo voice. I can tell you don't like it, so she got rid of it. But um, <laughs> it's, it would have been easy if she would have had a root of rejection in her life to go, oh, he doesn't think I'm pretty. He doesn't think anything I like is good. You can take every, the smallest notes, just the one shirt. Just everything else looks good. But you, you can take this one, you know, we all do this. You can take this one little thing, and if you have a root of rejection, you can misinterpret that, to, and you can think, okay, no, all he said was this, and I'm interpreting it as he hates me and he thinks I'm ugly. You know, I mean, you can interpret it as like, okay, he doesn't like me or she doesn't like me, whatever it is, and misinterpret this whole thing and, and assume that they are rejecting you. That's what, the, that's what the root of rejection does to you. It, it twists and it turns even the slightest thing. Like you could say, hey, you look, you look great today. And you're like, oh, you don't think I look great every day? You know, I mean, that's like this twisting of this, you know, this root of rejection, this twisting of things like, no, you look great every single day. Well, why don't you tell me? It's like, you know, it's like, anyway, someone with a root of rejection, I know this is in home, the way you're saying, responding, but the way someone with a root of rejection will interpret 
your comments or your lack of comments as rejection when you don't mean that at all. And so you, you can attribute like, okay, just an innocent thing that happened. I was like, oh, he hates me. She hates this shirt. Okay, whatever. Anyway, you know, just, just even, even and, and that's why it's so important to just, when someone says something and it, you feel triggered inside by it, to go, wait, okay, he or she is probably not rejecting me right now. I'm probably interpreting it through the lens of rejection because I've been rejected in the past. And it's really helpful when that happens because before you would have had, you would have had all kinds of responses that happen, anger or withdrawal or, you know, you might become defensive. If you find yourself becoming very defensive, you know, this probably happened to all of us. Someone says something and we start becoming very, very defensive about it. And we don't even realize it. And they're like, whoa, you're becoming really defensive right now. What happened? Well, in, in your mind, you're thinking they rejected you. So your defense mechanism is kicking in and you're becoming defensive. Well, what's really happening is you're interpreting that as them rejecting you. When they're not rejecting you, they're, they're just giving you some evaluation or a critique or whatever. But, you know, especially if, you know, like, like doing writing, if, you know, I, I write. And so <clears throat> when I get my stuff back from the editor, I mean, if I had a root of rejection still, I would be like come under complete woundedness because everything's, I mean, everything's red. I mean, it's like, oh, he hates, I'm terrible writer. It's like, no, he's making your writing better. Uh, he's making your product better. It, it, he's not saying you're, you're terrible. He's saying, no, what you wrote here, there's some good to it. Let's just make it better. But if you have a wound of rejection, you come under this thing where he, he's rejecting me. He thinks I'm terrible. I'm a terrible writer. So you, you got to, you know, to do anything of value or success or whatever, you've got to be free from the root of rejection or any type of critique or anything that's going to help you make you better. Anytime someone says, I don't really like the purple shirt, you're going to take that as rejection instead of saying, no, this is going to help make you better as a writer, as a person or whatever. Another way that rejection hits us is, is in, you know, just in, in, in social situations or just you can even say it in church. So many people have been wounded in the church. I want to ask you to raise your hands because some people might think I did it to you, but I know it would be from the other church you came from. But you've been wounded in a different church by leadership that has ulterior motives whatever the motives are that are not the Lord's motives, or you've been wounded by people in the church who have a religious spirit, or you've been wounded in the church by someone who manipulated or did something to you for their own sake and advantage. And so what is easy to happen when you've experienced that rejection is to say the whole church is corrupt. Every single person is corrupt. I'm just going to go worship Jesus in the prayer closet, and I'm not going to be near the church because the whole thing's corrupt. I mean, there, there's some truth there. We're, there was a lot of corruption in the church, but the whole thing's not corrupt. There's actually some good churches. There's actually some good leaders out there um, that are really trying to follow the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and spirit to follow him. But it's easy when, when the, uh, the church has let you down or an institution has let you down or, an, you know, whatever it is, your, your, your job has let you down to think everything's corrupt, to project that and become cynical to everything. It's just because you've been rejected. Okay, that's cynicism and distrust. All right, so we could probably end it there, but we got about five more that are just going to hit you as well, hit me as well. Is the next one we're going to look at, the fruit of rejection is jealousy. And so with, with jealousy, what, you know, we can be jealous without having rejection, but, but when you've been rejected, when you've experienced rejection, what happens when you've experienced rejection? It is a threat to your self-esteem. It is a threat to your ego. It's a threat to your self-worth. And, and if then you feel that threat, that rejection to who you are as a person, whatever it is they've rejected you for, whether it's appearance or whether it's intelligence or whether it's, you know, some problem you have or, you know, maybe you don't have all 10 fingers or, you know, whatever. I don't know what it is, you know. It could be a million different things of why they don't reject you or why they reject you is it can affect your self-worth. And when it affects your self-worth, what happens is you then see other people 
who have what you don't have and what you were rejected for. And when you see other people who have what you have and what you, what you were rejected for and they're praised for it, you began to get jealous of those people, especially on social media. <clears throat> Have I mentioned here before that social media is a mirage, that Instagram is not real life, that uh, Facebook is not real life, that the pictures that people put up are just one snapshot that makes it look like, wow, they have the best life and the best family, and they're so blessed by God. It's like, yeah, that's not reality. <laughs> that's not reality. Don't get jealous. Okay, hear this. Do not get jealous through social media. Do not get into comparison on social media that, well, this person's this, and they're great, and I'm not great, and all this stuff. Especially if you've been rejected in a certain area where this person is, is, you know, showing themselves to be great in the area where you've been rejected, it can, it can incite and stir up jealousy. Do not get jealous on social media. Their life is not as great as they're projecting it to be. I trust you. I promise you that. Their life is just probably as bad as yours. they got the same issues you have. It's just this image we put. I'm not saying don't, don't, you can, I'm not saying don't put pictures up there. You can do whatever you want. But uh, and I put pictures up there whenever we do something fun, which is very rare. But um, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. We're busy, okay? But... Um, Anyway, we're not going with that. But anyway, just do not get jealous over social media. It is, it is an illusion. People are not that happy. People are not that blessed. They've got all kind of stuff going on in their minds that you know nothing about. Just look at it and go, oh, nice picture, nice family, whatever. <clears throat> get to know them, get close to them, and you're like, so I guess I'm a little cynical, am I? Um, <clears throat> I've just been around the block here before and, you know, know this. Just, but when we've been rejected... What happens is it threatens our self-esteem, especially if, if they rejected us for something we did or something we lack or whatever, and the other person on Instagram has what we don't have, we can become jealous over that, or we can become jealous because we're afraid that we're going to lose what we need for our, emotion, our emotional well-being, our emotional support or whatever, and it can create comparison. We start comparing, comparing ourselves, well, they have this, and they're doing this, and their life looks great, and they're more beautiful than I am, or they're, they're more blessed than I am. And we start comparison, and it can create this jealousy, especially if we have insecurity issues or infer inferiority issues. It can fuel that jealousy um, to where we think, okay, they're blessed and I'm not blessed. So be very careful about jealousy and how, how jealousy is fueled by rejection. It's not only fueled by rejection, but it can be fueled by rejection. Okay. Next, next point here is judgmentalism, <clears throat> is we become judgmental. And here, here's what really is going on. We become judgmental. If you have a problem with criticism or if you have a problem with judging others a, a lot, nine times out of ten, what, what you're doing is you have experienced rejection. So what you're doing in your mind or what I'm doing in my mind is I'm rejecting them before they can reject me. As I'm coming up with these judgments of like, okay, well, this person's this and this person is that. They're this way. They're corrupt. They have bad motives. They're really doing it for a selfish gain, whatever it is. And I'm, I'm judging them before they can reject me. Does that make sense? I'm sure no one's ever, ever done that before. But especially if, if you struggle with criticism, a lot of times it's either rooted in, in low self-esteem or it's a protection mechanism you have in rejection to guard you from being rejected so that if I reject you before you reject me, then you can't reject me and I can stay protected and not hurt. See, when we become judgmental or we, get it, or we start joining in with the accuser of the brethren, it makes us feel better about ourselves. And that's the sad reality of it. When, when someone is doing something that we can criticize and judge, we actually feel better and we say, wow, they're doing this. I'm not doing this. I'm a better person than they are. I'm a better Christian than they are. I'm, I'm walking with the Lord more than they are. 
and it boosts our self-esteem. So if we have inferiority, if we have insecurity, it's very easy to become judgmental or critical because we're doing that to boost our self-esteem because we have a root of rejection. When, another way we become judgmental is if we, especially if someone has rejected us, and especially if, if some of that was some of our own doing, is what we do is we, we project that, that rejection onto them and say, well, the reason they rejected me is because they have this issue and they have that issue and they're this way and that way, and we use it to deflect the blame from ourselves so that we don't do this work and say, okay, no, I'm partly to blame for this. If I would not have done A, B, or C, they would not have rejected me the way they did, but instead we want to put, put all the blame on them so we don't have to take responsibility. See, also, too, someone who's very judgmental or critical is usually very insecure, and they're masking their insecurity through their criticism and judgment. Because what we're, do, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, I, I am better than them, and therefore it boosts my self-esteem and my self-worth. Even, even when you think about this, when we, do, when we get into judgmental, judgmentalism or criticism, what we do is we put people into categories. And we say, okay, this person falls into this category. I'm just going to use an example of uh, just in the church, okay? So we, we, you know, we, we say, okay, well, this person believes in Calvinism or this person believes in the gifts of the Spirit have passed away. We just automatically put them into these categories. We, we categorize people in this way. Um, and it could be in a million different ways we do this, but we categorize them as they are this, they are that, into these categories that we evaluate by judgment so that we can then, what we do is we say, okay, well, these categories are lower, and I'm actually in the category that's higher. You, you see what I'm saying? We categorize people through judgment, and what we're doing is creating this hierarchy in our mind. We don't even realize it, but we, we all do this. I do it. <clears throat> we all do this, and, and what's driving that a lot of times is the root of rejection because if we can categorize people, we can feel better about ourselves, and we can then say, okay, well, my insecurity is atoned for because they are in this category. That judgmental, that judgmentalism. Does that make sense? What we, does that make sense? Is this helpful? Okay. This nailing everybody? Yeah. Uh, when also, too, what happens is when you are rejected, it takes away your sense of control. Um, and so in a way to try to maintain control and to maintain the narrative, so to speak, so that, so that what's happening in a given situation is not coming against you and you're not looking at blame, is you can then become judgmental to, to maintain that control or to cope with uncertainty. Okay, so that's, that's judgmentalism. We ju if, I, if I reject you before you reject me, you can't reject me. Okay, then the fear of rejection. So many people live with a fear of rejection or an anxiety about being rejected. You have been rejected. You've experienced rejection. The pain of that rejection is so unpleasant that it creates a fear of rejection or a, an anxiety about rejection that you start doing certain things to guard you from future rejection, and it's, it's a spirit of fear. It's a spirit of fear rooted in rejection, past rejection, fear of abandonment, where especially if you've been close to somebody and, and, and their trust was violated and you were abandoned, that fear of abandonment can actually can be fueled by, by deep abandonment, that where you start projecting that onto others in any given situation, where you know it's not really you're not really being abandoned, but you can think that you are being abandoned. It can stir up all kinds of emotions of fear and anxiety, um, you know, fear of rejection. That if if these emotional needs that I have are not met in this relationship or in this friendship or whatever then you begin to think, I'm never going to have this, this emotional need met, and you begin to fear rejection. And then what happens when you begin to fear rejection is you actually hinder the relationships you need. So when you have a fear of rejection, 
Your, people can smell the fear of rejection. Uh, not literally, but they can sense this, the fear of rejection. And so what happens is when you have a fear of rejection, you actually begin to experience more rejection because what you fear comes upon you. Because what you're doing is you're trying to protect yourself from a fear of rejection from being rejected again. And then what ends up happening is the things you did to protect yourself are the cause of the rejection. And you end up getting rejected again and deeper from that fear. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so you've got to be careful of that fear of rejection. Defensiveness. Just, just pay attention. <laughs> pay attention to how easily you are defensive. Why did you do this? Well, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I was a pastor. I, I, I just, just, why did you say that? Why did you preach for this long? Why did you preach on this topic, you know? It's easy for me to interpret that as you're rejecting me, and all of a sudden I'm getting defensive, trying to defend myself so that I don't, I don't get rejected. But just pay attention to how easily you get defensive, and you're arguing your case. I'm not saying every single time. No, don't go overboard. I mean, you got to express, you know, your thoughts and opinions, but just, just pay attention. That am, am I defensive right now to try to protect my worth? Or my, am I perceiving this as rejection, and therefore I'm, I'm getting angry or I'm getting defensive or I'm arguing back because I think what you're doing is rejection? See, when we get def defensiveness is a mechanism to protect ourselves, it's the way we protect ourselves from future rejection. But again, that in and of itself causes us to experience more rejection. Because, <coughs> sorry, the cold on one second. <coughs> Got this cold here. Talking too much stirs up congestion. Uh, when I say cold, I'm over the cold. Don't be afraid of it. But um, residue. Um, when, when um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. But when you're defensive, you're trying to protect yourself from rejection. You're trying to protect yourself from rejection, and that defensiveness is causing you to experience more rejection. Like, all I'm doing is saying, you know, you should say this, instead of saying this this way, you should say it this way. Oh, you think I stink. You think I'm a terrible speaker. You think I'm a terrible writer. I'm, I'm just a terrible person, you know? Well, no, you got a root of rejection. All I was saying is, like, if you didn't say this this way, and I'm not saying you guys come up and tell me what I said wrong in this message. I'm just saying, just giving you an example of how you get defensive, how we can get defensive as a mechanism to guard us from rejection, to, guard, to avoid pain, to maintain that sense of control and things like that. <clears throat> hardness, which is kind of related to defensiveness. Hardness is is also a defense mechanism where what we do is we say, okay, I've experienced this emotional pain. It's too much for me to bear. I'm going, you know, we don't, we don't think about this, but what we, we subconsciously, what we do is we harden ourselves so that we can't feel future rejection. And we become hardened as a way to protect ourselves from future pain. Does that make sense? Where we we don't even realize it, but we're, we become hardened to protect ourselves. We, you know, to, you know, whether, you know, whether when you've been rejected, you, may, you feel very vulnerable, you feel very exposed. And to guard against that terrible feeling is we become hardened. We become, we put up these walls, we put up these defense mechanisms so we won't have to experience that uh, again. And, and so, you know, a lot of people, without even realizing it, have become hardened because of past pain. And, and when we're hardened by the past pain, we cannot be true lovers. We cannot be true lovers. We cannot be lovers of God. We cannot be lovers of people. We cannot fulfill the first commandment or the second commandment. See, we must have that tender, pliable heart in the hand of God. God's love must come and wash over us and tenderize us so that the hardness goes away so we can be tender to the Lord. And so just, just going back here, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 3 as we bring this to a close. Is there's, there's a million, and I would encourage you just to read the notes 
and, and go, walk through this because, especially if you've experienced rejection, to see the way you have responded um, and, and even just to go, oh, you know what? I'm responding this way. I'm becoming defensive right now because I think this is rejection. I'm perceiving this as rejection when it's actually you just telling me that you should do this way differently. And, and when you start realizing that, what happens is you'll experience less and less and less rejection and you'll go deeper and deeper in the love of God. So again, back to Ephesians chapter three, Paul's praying and he's, and he's um, asking the Lord for that experience of the love of Christ. I encourage you, I, I just, you know, make this part of your, of your prayer is Father, Lord, would you allow me according to Ephesians chapter three, verse 17, to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. Lord, would you allow me to, my, my root system to be taken out of the soil of rejection over here that's producing the fruit of distrust and cynicism, that's producing the, the fruit of hardness, that's producing the fruit of jealousy, that's for producing the fruit of disillusionment and uh, defensiveness that's producing all this fruit. Would you take me out of this, this soil of rejection and would you transplant me into the soil of your love to experience your love, to go down deep into your love so my root system would go down into your love so that every thought and every emotion and every desire and every choice is flowing up out of the soil of your love so that I can produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness and self-control. Make that your prayer. Father, root and ground me in your love. Lord, let me comprehend with the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Lord, let me know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Right there. Not a, not a love that it can be articulated in human knowledge, but a love that is greater than knowledge, a love that must be experienced. It's, it, it, what Paul's talking about, what, that Paul's talking about that you must have is the experience of God's love. You must have the experience of God's love. And if you don't have the experience of God's love, and it's not, one, it's not a one-time experience, it's an ongoing experience of God's love. If you don't have that experience of God's love, most likely you will produce some of this fruit of rejection, rebellion, insecurity, independence, distrust, hardness, disillusionment, all these different things will be produced, judgmentalism will be produced by you because you're not rooted and grounded in the love of God by the experience of it. And so let me pray. We're going to end here. Let me just pray for you, those listening, and just pray for you here, that God would root us and ground us in his love. Just ask the Lord right now. Just, just stay engaged with this right here. Ask the Lord. Just say yes and amen. Don't zone out right now. Just say, God, do this, to, do this for me. I need this. I need it as well. Lord, I just pray right now to everyone who is listening online, listening in person. Lord, I just pray right now that you would root us and ground us in the love of God that surpasses knowledge. J just believe right now. Just believe. <clears throat> you need this. I believe God will give you this. Just believe it, though. Believe God's going to do it. Lord, I, I just pray right now that you would take our are just our boxes all the way of trying to fit your love into a box. I just ask you, Lord, to move in such a powerful, supernatural way, Lord, that you would reveal through experience the love of Jesus Christ to everyone who desires it. Lord, everyone here, Lord, who, who wants that, I just pray. Just say yes and amen right now to that. If you want to just say yes, Lord, amen. amen. Father, I ask you, Lord, to just come in the unique way that you do for all of us. And Lord, you would, you would just baptize us in the love of God. 
Lord, immerse us in the love of God. Lord, that we would be rooted and grounded in your love. Lord, that the root systems of our life would go deep into the love of God, I pray. And that, Lord, we would be transplanted from the soil of rejection into the soil of the infinite love of God. Lord, may we experience your personal affection for each of us. Not just to have a Bible teaching, not just to have a sermon, not just to read a book, not just to sing, sing a song, but Lord, may we experience the, the, the affection of the Lord and be touched by your love, I pray. Lord, give us the faith to experience your love. Lord, let your love be expressed in that personal way to everyone, Lord, who desires it. Everyone who said yes and amen. Lord, I pray you would express your love to them in a way that's personal and unique. Lord, whether it's the experience of baptism of love, whether it's something you do for them that's so kind, whether it's you speak a word to them, Lord, would you just release a baptism of love into them in such a way that would root and ground them in the love of God? Lord, and I pray that, Lord, in Jesus' name, may we do all that we do from the soil of your love in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to end the online portion here. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless you. Okay, so...